Hi, everyone, and uh, welcome to another session in the Open Source Summit. Uh, my name is Javier Luraski. I'm a software engineer at our studio. And in this talk, we're going to talk about a new uh, project on the LFAI Foundation called Sparkly R, which uh, can help you democratize AI with uh, really useful tools like Apache Spark and uh, similar tools in the community. So um, actually, uh, I'm really excited for this talk because uh, we usually don't get to talk about the R community and open source projects on the R community with the broader open source community. So uh, before we start, I want to give you like a quick overview of um, what is uh, the place that I work on and the specific team that I'm uh, working on as, as well. So uh, our studio is a public benefit corporation and mostly its mission is to support the R community. R is a programming language and we'll talk about this in a second. Uh, but I kind of like wanted to let you know that, um, you know, like uh, R Studio is this community that supports our studio, uh, R, the R community. And it has a lot of open source products and as well as professional products. Uh, and most importantly, it supports organizations like the Linux Foundation, which we are uh, proudly supporters of. And we also have uh, various customers uh, that you can check out under rstudio.com. Now, within our studio, the team that I work on is mostly uh, tasked with bringing artificial intelligence technology technologies to the R community. Uh, so, for instance, a lot of the communities, uh, a lot of the technologies that we usually work on are things like uh, Spark, TensorFlow, PyTorch, MLflow, Horobot, and why not? So, so that's kind of like the space where I come from uh, within the R community and R Studio itself. But uh, let's talk for a second about uh, what is artificial intelligence. Now, there's usually a lot of, uh, you know, like feelings and like points of view on what artificial intelligence is. Uh, from my point of view, uh, artificial, all that artificial intelligence is, is a set of technologies. And it's a set of technologies that helps us solve some types of problems. And to get more concrete on kind of like what I consider artificial intelligence, uh, we should we can take a look at two of the projects that uh, were pretty important in the development of this field. So the first one is the paper that you're seeing on your left side of the screen, uh, which basically is uh, the paper that give uh, gave momentum to the deep learning community. It's uh, the AlexNet paper where um, Alex and uh, Jeff Hinton basically put together a system that could outperform the current computer vision tasks. And uh, kind of like from there on, like deep learning has evolved into multiple, uh, several disciplines like reinforcement learning and, you know, uh, many other interesting fields. Uh, but as well, like one of the most more recent developments that I consider also pretty important on artificial intelligence is the development of AlphaGo by DeepMind's uh, team. And basically, well, what AlphaGo did was to uh, create an algorithm that could compete on the Go um, board game, which happens to be a very challenging uh, board game, which was considered kind of like beyond human, uh, beyond uh, kind of like algorithmic capabilities, because it requires intuition and some creativity to actually succeed in playing it. And um, this uh, this algorithm basically also succeeded against uh, in, in in a series of matches against the current uh, world champion, which was uh, which is Lisa Doll, or at the time was the champion. And um, in general, uh, this is what I consider modern artificial intelligence. And these are the set of tools or the set of problems that we're interested in solving uh, with tools like Sparkly R and uh, that we'll see in a second. So kind of like. Um, if we were to drill down into this, um, you know, we can we talk about the problems that uh, we can solve uh, with artificial intelligence, but let's start talking about the tools that are useful. And what we have in this chart, uh, we're basically plotting what are the state of the art deep learning and AI models over time, right? So at the very uh, left of your screen, uh, you can see that AlexNet, uh, somewhere in there, the paper that we just mentioned, uh, was considered a state of, of the art. And kind of like more recently, we have uh, uh, um, another systems like AlphaGo and OpenAI's uh, Dota's one versus one model, which, you know, they actually on the Y axis, what we have is the number of petaflops, basically the number of computing power that is required 
to achieve uh, training of these particular AI models. And uh, we have one, one monitor twist in this plot, which is uh, what you can see on gray are the models that require a single computer to be trained. And the ones in uh, black are the models that require more than one computer to train. Usually they require hundreds or even thousands of computers to train. And you can see that it's very clear that um, deep learning has moved away from training on a single machine to making it more obvious uh, the need to actually train across clusters of computers. So uh, we can identify a few, a few specific technologies that are important for artificial intelligence. Uh, one would be obviously deep learning, uh, reinforcement learning, uh, statistical analysis, which we usually take for granted, but you know, like a lot of the core concepts of how do we measure errors and variance and things like that, uh, they come from you know like plain statistical analysis that uh, are also part of or that I would consider part of AI, and more recently as well, what we call distributed computing, which is going to be related to build uh, our, our our rest of the talk with uh, uh, technologies like Apache Spark, which really enable uh, using distributed computing across multiple uh, en environments and multiple uh, uh, with large scale models. So, uh, you know, I've mentioned already a few, but to even drill down even, even more on these particular technologies, we know that we want to use things like deep learning, reinforcement learning. But if we look at the actual frameworks that are pretty useful today, uh, you will hear things like Apache Spark for transforming big data sets into something that a GPU can consume. Uh, things like TensorFlow, which is a graph computation engine that works on GPUs, similar to PyTorch, which is gaining momentum. Uh, MLflow, a new uh, open source project to help you manage the life cycle of your AI workflows that just uh, got incorporated into the family of Linux Foundation projects. Horobot, which can bridge the gap between uh, Spark or Spark-like clusters and uh, TensorFlow uh, libraries. All, all of these frameworks are required with, uh, for artificial intelligence. So um, kind of like now the question is like, well, we have, we have these great frameworks like what, why do we need anything else, right? Like, um, you know, obviously Apache Spark and TensorFlow are, are already pretty great. Why do we need, you know, Sparkly R or other frameworks apart from these, right? And to understand um, kind of like the state of the art today, um, you know, I have a couple, um, you know, like comics from XKCD that explain a little bit the challenges that we face today. So my background is in computer science and, you know, like um, when I went to school, I work on things like C and C++. Uh, so when you compare like the C language to, for instance, Python, um, you can make the case that uh, Python is so much more simpler than C. And, and I think that would be true. Um, I, I think Linus Torvalds in, um, in the keynote this morning kind of like um, talk a little bit about C and kind of like how usually C is, is a hardcore level programming language and a, a low level programming language that, uh, you know, it's used. So Python is definitely simpler, but uh, there's still a lot of complexity when we look at things like Python or Kubernetes, not for computer science people per se, but especially for people that are not proficient on computer science, right? So if we're thinking about people that are doing data science that have a uh, statistics background and people like, you know, biologists or, or you know, like um, people in the phar pharmacy industry, like think even simple things like installing Python could be actually quite hard. And here, one of the comics that we have is for those of you that use Python, um, you can see that um, you know you might find some familiarity in this diagram where even installing a package, you know, you need to figure out uh, first like what is the, the virtual environment technology that you're using, and you know, like it can get it can get pretty tricky. Um, you know, in the day to day. So not to say that Python is not great. It's just to say that. Uh, there is definitely room for improvement to make things even simpler, which kind of like bring us, brings us to the topic of this talk. Like, how do we make artificial intelligence uh, more accessible to people, or how do we democratize it such that more people can use it? And uh, uh, what, what I want to mention here is kind of like give you an introduction to the R programming language and the R community. So uh, the R programming language was a, a programming language developed, uh, I believe, three years after the first release of Python. Uh, but the interesting thing about the, uh, program, the R programming language is that it was built uh, by statisticians. And really, at the time, it was, it was a tool for statisticians to um, kind of like build uh, an, an environment that allows them to create uh, statistical computing 
uh, in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, 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 uh, in its own environment. And a statistical computing is really what we call today data science is marrying, uh, the stati statistics with computing. And I would argue that it's a great uh, project for, uh, for data science in general. Now, what is more interesting is like the R community, uh, knowing that statistics is used by a lot of people in this world that they're not necessarily computer scientists. Uh, the type of people that work in the R community, a lot of times are either data scientists, but also biologists or, um, you know, like people in the pharmaceutical industry, uh, finance people, uh, you know, people doing uh, psychology or even art. So uh, the range of people that have to apply statistics is obviously pretty broad. And uh, a lot of the users in the art community, uh, you know, like they're focused more on solving the problem without really having to want to learn, you know, like what are, what are all these technology stacks that we talk about, you know, like in, 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 you know, like in the, in the scope of computer science, which is pretty common. And, uh, the other thing to mention is like the chart on your right side of the screen. Uh, it basically shows the number of downloads of packages, uh, per day that the R community has been providing. And as you can see, it's a pretty vibrant community. Uh, I don't know if this would be considered exponential growth, but it definitely seems, uh, pretty steep, especially in the last year. So, um, it's, it's a pretty vibrant community and it's full of people that, um, you know, don't necessarily have as their main goal to become computer scientists, which I find quite interesting. So it really opens the door to create uh, packages and technologies that really allow uh, a different type and a, and a more diverse uh, user group to use technologies like artificial intelligence. And this brings us, you know, to the topic of this talk, which is Sparkly R. So uh, what is Sparkly R? Well, Sparkly R is an open source modern interface to scale your data science and machine learning workflows using Apache Spark and many packages that are intertwined and supported by the R community. Uh, now, you know, there's, there's a lot to digest in this diagram, but, you know, at the core, at the core of what this Sparkly R is, is an interface to Apache Spark. Uh, but it goes beyond that. Uh, it allows you to use this very powerful computing framework, which is Apache Spark, uh, with all the tools that surround them, right? So, you know, like if you're running Apache Spark, you probably want to run it on top of Hadoop Yarn or Mesos or Kubernetes. Um, you know, Kubernetes being uh, kind of like this great project also from the Linux Foundation, which allows you to use kind of like C group style, um, you know, Linux kernel technologies to really um, virtualize efficiently uh, processes in your cluster. And, you know, there's also other technologies like H2O A uh, AI is a company and also open source uh, project that allows you to do advanced modeling at large scale, XGBoost, which might be familiar to some of you that are doing, um, you know, machine learning or AI, and technologies like MLEAP that allow you to export pipelines. So even though the main purpose of Sparkly R is creating this interface to Apache Spark, uh, you know, like the same momentum that Apache Spark is having of bringing the rest of the AI community into uh, kind of like an easy to use distributed computing framework, uh, Sparkly R is trying to accommodate like all the needs that uh, kind of like surround Spark on its own. And um, it's also gr great to mention uh, in this conference that Sparkly R joined uh, the Linux Foundation early in 2020. So definitely we've been uh, quite excited and uh, to join the Linux Foundation under the Linux Foundation AI Foundation, which uh, has been a great uh, partner to help us, uh, you know, move this project forward. And we're, uh, I definitely look forward for some of you to get interested in this project. So, you know, getting into the specifics of the actual code, um, how, how do you use Sparkly R? And, you know, we're going to spend some time in this slide because I think it's actually pretty great. Uh, not, not, not the slide per se, but like what it's communicating. And it's, it's some of the work that we put into making this package and this interface really quite easy to use for any user, right? So, um, as you can see here, there's uh, two lines, uh, after the install Spark command, which, uh, basically, um, you know, request to Sparkly R to, well, first be installed. So you kind of need to, um, ask, uh, you know, the uh, R runtime to install Sparkly R and you can execute that with one line of code. This would be similar to pip install, but like the great thing about, uh, the R, uh, interface is that, uh, you can basically run everything through a single REPL. So you don't need to teach your users to get out and install and run pip, pip install out of, um, 
of, the, of their environment, right? And then the second line, what we're actually running is installing Spark. Uh, it's basically just installing Spark on your local computer. Now you can also use a existing proper Spark cluster, uh, but you know, like a lot of times you want to work locally and it's much easier to start working locally than, uh, you know, like starting with a full on cluster. And then once you have a Spark installed, uh, you can just simply connect to it. And the command that you use there is Spark connect. And then you can say master equals local or yarn or Kubernetes or, you know, other technologies like Livy or Spark standalone or why not. And uh, one of the great things about this is that uh, it also works on Windows. So a lot of the R users, uh, you know, tend to be Windows users uh, just because Windows is still pretty uh, prominent operating system in the desktop space. So we wanted to make sure that, you know, this is enabled for users that are getting ramped up in technologies like artificial intelligence. We want to make sure that they're well served in these uh, type of uh, environments. All right, so uh, kind of like that gives a very high level overview of how to get started with Spark and uh, using the R programming language. Uh, what we're going to look at this slide is kind of like understand a bit more like what is the actual functionality that you get from Spark and their ecosystem and uh, Sparkly R. So uh, we already talked about the first two commands, which is installing Spark and connecting to Spark. Uh, but the next interesting comment is uh, loading data into Spark. So usually you have large data sets stored on HDFS or, uh, you know, in S3 buckets, Azure, uh, Google Cloud or Databricks and, and why not? So you have these large data sets and you need to read them and you need to read them in parallel across multiple machines. Uh, so for, for running that particular, um, kind of like process, you can use, uh, uh, functions like Spark read. And then we have like over, more than a dozen of different formats that you can use. You can say Spark read CSV, Spark read uh, JSON, Avro, Parquet, uh, you know, uh, text based and, and a few others. So you can very easily uh, load data from large data sets into Spark. And honestly, you know, the code here looks like local code that you could run on your local machine that we can actually run, but it also scales to huge numbers of, uh, worker nodes and in general uh, nodes in your cluster environment. Um, then you can do data analysis. You can do, uh, you can obviously run SQL statements. Um, I said obviously because I work in Spark, but um, you know, it might not be obvious uh, in, in general if you're learning about Apache Spark, but uh, Apache Spark supports SQL statements. Uh, so you can use SQL directly to perform those operations. Uh, but in the R community, we also have a pretty great package called uh, Deplier. And uh, what the plier allows you to do is create uh, SQL queries or that or SQL analysis operations in a very concise, concise uh, manner. So as you can see here, uh, this statement summarize cars uh, where, where you want the total number, like the, the count of N. Uh, this is basically what we call the plier uh, syntax uh, provided by the deplier package, which is a grammar of data manipulation, which makes data analysis much more concise. And uh, our, our users definitely love this particular uh, functionality and package. Um, but you know, like if you're familiar with SQL, you can always use SQL statements. And you can also do things like plotting and linear regressions. And for that, I wanna switch and share my screen and give you a sense of kind of like how this works and also show you the more advanced functionality running uh, the Sparkly R package. So I'm gonna share my screen in a second and all right, so uh, what you should be seeing is uh, what um, uh, a screen with RStudio running. Uh, first of all, I wanna mention that the R programming language is, is just, an, uh, it's just a programming language, right? And it has all the features from a programming language that you would expect. So for instance, in this case, I have a console, a terminal running, right? And if I were to run R once it's installed, you would basically get, you know, like a REPL prompt similar to, uh, uh, Python, uh, Scala, or why not? So, you know, like uh, when you're here in this terminal, you can run something like library Sparkly R if you already have it installed or actually install it. Uh, now, you know, like in the same way that uh, a lot of you probably use, uh, instead of using Python directly, you use either Jupyter or uh, IDEs like, um, um, you know, like uh, JetBrains uh, IDE, uh, PyCharm. Um, 
in, in a similar way, uh, our studio is also an open source project uh, that supports uh, free uh, access to an IDE for the R community. So that's what you're seeing here. So rather than executing the code on the on the R terminal, uh, in this particular demo, I'm going to use R Studio. And there's a few things that we want to run. Uh, so first of all, I've, I have created an, an R notebook for us for this particular presentation. And I'm just going to run a few kind of like pre-preparation uh, steps for, for, for the data in general. And then I'm, I'm going to run the comment that we just discussed. So in this particular case, installing Spark is pretty easy. We can run Spark install. And in this case, you know, it's already installed, so we're good. And then we can connect to uh, Apache Spark. And again, we, we do that with what, only one line of code, which I think is, is great. And especially the installation, which is the hard part of actually getting a Spark running locally, especially on Windows. We can, we can launch, launch uh, uh, the Spark. Uh, uh, yeah, so um, anyways. Uh, so um, I'm only sharing the screen part of uh, the R Studio version, uh, the window. But like, if we, if I were to share like the entire screen, you would be able to see kind of like uh, Spark running in the browser, which um, you know it's it, it does what you would, what you would expect. Um, then the other thing that we can do is we can actually uh, let me just make sure that I'm still uh, yeah. So the, the next thing that we can do is uh, we can load data sets, which is the next uh, kind of like line that we have here. And what we're doing here is we're basically loading a data set, which happens to be defined locally, but it happens to be, you know, like if, if this was, was defined in HDFS, it would work in a similar way. And you can see here that you have your data set, uh, which we just loaded into Spark. And you can also look at the preview of the data set, which, um, you know, like it's, it's just there and it's working. And uh, it's pretty easy. Like you know, it's uh, what we want. To, we want to make sure that um, tools like Sparkly are are easy to use, and that's exactly what we're doing. Uh, we can run a count of records. You know, for our small data set that we have here, it's just 32 records, but this scales as well in Spark to you know like billions or uh, thousands of, of records whatsoever. Um, and again, we're running here SQL SQL comments. Now, uh, one of the popular packages for the R community is a package called ggplot2. And uh, what this package allows you to do is basically do plots in the R community and for the R programming language. And it's, it's such a popular package that a lot of times it's even used from Python. And what we can do is kind of like also use uh, ggplot2 to, for instance, in this case, sample a subset of the data set and then just simply um, plotted, which is what we're doing here. So we see that this particular data set, um, you know, like uh, it's plotting the weight of a car against their efficiency in miles per gallon. And we can see that, you know, the heavier the vehicle, the slower it becomes, right? Well, the less efficient that it becomes. Uh, the miles per gallon simply go down, right? Because you have more weight that you're moving. And we're, we're seeing that in this particular, uh, you know, visualization already. But uh, what you can also do with uh, Sparkly R and in general with Apache Spark is you can do, you can use over uh, dozens, if not hundreds of different uh, mo modeling frameworks and also uh, feature transformers that basically allow you to create anything from uh, a simple linear regression to something as complex as a deep neural network. So what we're doing here is we're gonna run a linear regression and uh, this linear regression is running again on Apache Spark, but it's quite easy to run. And uh, as you can see here is that we see that there's an inverse correlation on the weight that we see on the actual uh, plot. So this is obviously what we want to see. And um, you know, there's, there's many other fra frameworks and modeling approaches that you can use. Uh, as I mentioned, one of the popular ones is XGBoost, which we have support for. Um, so definitely, you know, like uh, you have like a lot of tools, including H2O AI, which um, can support you with uh, some other types of modeling frameworks and different metrics while you're doing um, uh, modeling in Apache Spark. So uh, there's a few other features that are interesting. Uh, a lot of times our users want to stay within the, the R 
uh, our framework, right? There's the tools that they want. It's easy to use. And, you know, like it's simply, you know, like uh, what they're used to, right? But a lot of times you want to export that functionality that you built from R into other tools like, you know, like Java enabled devices or Python or Apache Spark itself. And for that, uh, what we support is the concept of pipelines. So basically a pipeline allows you to extract a version of your R computation that was defined in Spark as a, you know, as a programming language agnostic functionality that you can basically reuse from uh, other environments. I would consider this pretty advanced functionality. So, you know, um, if, if it doesn't make a lot of sense, uh, that's, that's fine. Um, and another kind of like advanced functionality that we support is um, calling low level interfaces. Because there's always, or not always, but there's a times need to call more advanced functionality that is, uh, you know, perhaps different or not yet available on the package. Or you might have to call functionality that is not available on Spark, but that is available on R. And we have support to basically um, call those level functionalities in Scala, but also use Spark to use functionality from R. And in this case, what we did is we just counted the number of records but we use an R function to count the number of records. Um, it's, it's a little bit more complex than this because whenever you're doing uh, you know, computation in a distributed fashion, you need to consider multiple uh, computing environments, uh, not environments, but co multiple computing instances. And, uh, but in general, it's kind of like great that uh, to have the functionality that enables, enables you to grow beyond what the Sparkly R framework supports initially. And uh, last but not least, um, a lot of times we want to support real-time data sets, right? And uh, there's frameworks out there that are specialized in real-time processing. But for the past two or three years, uh, Apache Spark has also been adding features to process real-time data sets with something that they called Spark Structured Streaming, which uh, is supported in Sparkly R for the R community and basically it's, um, it, it's currently processing in real time uh, this particular folder, which is the input folder. Uh, but the great thing about this framework is in the, uh, in, the, in the same way that we're creating a stream from a CSV file, you can create a stream from a Kafka uh, uh, provider or uh, from similar sources that support uh, structured streaming. And uh, you can use the same tools like Deplier or uh, you know, like the model, uh, scoring a model or using uh, custom R transformations written in R to uh, address real-time data sets with your same infrastructure, which again is one of the benefits of, um, of using Apache Spark as a unified platform that can allow you to really scale your AI workflows from simple data analysis to real-time data sets to things like deep learning and reinforcement learning as well. All right, I'm gonna stop sharing our slides. And um, yeah, so we basically, you know, cover uh, this slide as a few demos that we can do with uh, with the Sparkly R project. And um, what I want to do now is, uh, and let me just uh, stop something. Uh, yes, so what I want to do now is uh, we're going to move to the next slide and I want to present uh, kind of like a much more complex use case of Apache Spark and Sparkly R. Uh, this is this is what I would consider, you know, like a proper AI workflow that you know it's involving distributed computing with also tools like uh, Keras and TensorFlow. So uh, the way that it works is, you know, it's a little bit more complex because you're mixing, you know, uh, concepts from uh, deep learning with also distributed computing. But as you can see here, is we can we can create a distributed model quite easily, and what we're doing here is, well, first of all, we're connecting to Spark in the code that you see on this slide. And then we're uh, basically telling each our each of our uh, computing instances to perform a particular task. And in this particular task, what we're telling each of the instances to do is to load TensorFlow and Keras. And then we're saying things like, OK, you need to load a configuration file, which, you know, like uh, for brevity, I'm reducing in code uh, here. And then uh, we're selecting our distributed training strategy. We're def and we're creating our actual deep learning model. We're compiling it, and then finally we're fitting it. And what is great about this code is that it's really executing across multiple computers and even uh, multiple GPUs if each computer is uh, 
has support for a GPU, right? So um, kind of like this brings together like a uh, kind of like more, more elaborate use case of how you can use uh, Sparkly R in combinations with uh, technologies that support deep learning and uh, more advanced frameworks in a kind of like single interface that really allows you to scale your AI workflows with this. So uh, kind of like to give you a little bit uh, of background of what the Sparkly R project is and where it is and where it's going. Uh, so uh, the, the Sparkly R project uh, got launched on late 2016. So it has been a little bit more over three years and um, yeah, almost four years. And uh, it is great to see today that it's supported by most uh, cloud providers. Uh, so uh, Amazon, AWS, Azure, Cloudera, Databricks, they all have, you know, uh, support in different degrees uh, from having it properly documented how you can use it in their platforms to having full integrations in platforms like Databricks and Cubal or RStudio products. Uh, not only that, but the project has grown to uh, be centric on RStudio to incorporate other uh, contributors from the open source community like Databricks and Cubal. Uh, so that's also great. Uh, we have customers that have been kind enough to allow us to list them as uh, users of Sparkly R, like 8451, Equifax, uh, Express Scripts, uh, Catchbrook Analytics, Edex, and Netflix. And last but not least, as I mentioned, uh, the Sparkly R project joined the Linux Foundation within the LFAI Foundation uh, earlier in this year. And I must say that they have been great partners uh, helping us grow the project, um, especially uh, I think uh, looking at today's uh, earlier keynote from Linus Torvalds, like um, I think really the maker attitude of focusing on building stuff, it's something that I've seen uh, the Linux Foundation in general supporting where uh, there's very low overhead per se and more emphasis is put on helping developers like myself uh, really bring projects to life uh, in the open source community and supporting them. So um, yeah, that's that's pretty pretty great. And uh, just kind of like to recap where this project is, I know that it has been a lot for sure, um, but I want to give you like an overview of, you know, Sparkly R around with all their ecosystem. Um, so Sparkly R on itself, it's an interface that supports many packages and may, may, lots of technologies. We talk a little bit of about Apache Spark as a, a large scale computing in, uh, engine. Uh, but there's also supporting Sparkly R for Delta Lake, which happens to be a pretty new project, um, which also happened to be donated, I believe, last year to the Linux Foundation, uh, which allows you to scale your data sets in um, kind of like data warehouse uh, environment or uh, in, in on top of technologies like Apache Spark that were designed with high scalability in mind. And so, yeah, you can use Sparkly R to access Delta Lake as well. We have uh, uh, Spark readers like Spark Read uh, Delta and Spark Write Delta that easily allow you to connect to Delta Lake. And as I mentioned, uh, we've, we spend a good amount of time figuring out how to interoperate with tools like TensorFlow and Keras. And um, a couple other tools that I didn't mention or projects that are related to Sparkly R is we have support for Apache Levy and Apache Arrow. Uh, Apache Levy being a REST uh, a web interface to Apache, uh, to Apache Spark and the Apache Arrow project being this uh, technology agnostic, programming language agnostic way of storing data frames and manipulating data frames, which, um, you know, like we use to optimize performance in Sparkly R when using uh, Spark, Arrow and the R programming language. Um, I mentioned a few other uh, kind of like high level packages that are, are not just packages, but uh, infrastructure that is related with Sparkly R like H2O AI, XGBoost and MLIP. Uh, but that's that kind of like covers what it's supported on the R community. Uh, we also have, as I mentioned, ways of extracting the functionality that you create within R to other languages like Python and Java with things like pipelines and uh, packages like Reticulate. And in general, we have this philosophy, uh, at least on our team, and I think um, 
that um, we want to enable people to work locally. Uh, we believe that working in your local computer is as important as working on a computer that has a GPU or a, or, or a remote cluster, uh, mostly because it allows you allows us to lower the barrier of entry to technologies that, you know, like in the past were only accessible to, uh, you know, big teams of uh, artificial intelligence experts. Uh, now you can use them directly on your local computer. And once you learn to use them and once you have the workflows working, you can get computing either on a cluster or with a GPU and kind of like lower the barrier of entry, which is all this talk is about. We're basically trying to lower, uh, you know, like how, how hard it is to get to use AI technologies. And we think that the R uh, programming language is a great way of lowering um, the bar of entry to computer science topics like, you know, artificial intelligence and distributed computing and why not. Um, so kind of like that's how we view this. All right, so I'm gonna leave you with some, res well, actually before I leave you with some resources, I just wanna uh, kind of like talk a little bit about contributing. So um, as I mentioned, you know, like the project is quite new or at least for open source, uh, successful open source projects. It, it just, it was just pretty humbling to hear, you know, that Linux has been out for almost 30 years. We take that for granted, but uh, you know, like that'd be awesome if, uh, if open source pack packages, uh, you know, could last that long, but definitely, you know, like we're still pretty early. We're, as I mentioned, about three years in, um, and we still have a lot of major features to contribute to. Uh, we have about a dozen, major features that the community has proposed and several dozens that we have implemented. And we also have a lot of GitHub issues for those developers that might be interested in supporting it. Or if you want to be a user of Sparkly R in your organization and then contribute back, definitely there's a lot of, uh, you know, like opportunity there to help. Um, and, you know, not to say that there's a lot of GitHub issues open. There's also over a thousand, thousands of GitHub issues that have been resolved on the project, uh, but we definitely want to uh, you know, encourage if you if you feel curiosity for this project there or contributing, uh, you know, by all means, you can find us on github.com slash sparklyr, uh, where we have most of our projects currently. It's really just the sparklyr main uh, project uh, where you can follow development and, and why not. And um, yeah, I should mention that uh, we have uh, some resources that are super useful. I know that it's really hard to pack in a single, you know, like 40 minute, 50 minute talk, uh, everything that is to know about uh, a packet, uh, an open source project. But if you want to learn more about Sparkly R, uh, the, the landing page that you should vis visit is sparklyr.ai. Uh, this is the official Linux Foundation landing page uh, for the project. And from there, you know, uh, there's not a lot of information, but there's a lot of pointers uh, that can take you to, you know, additional resources. Uh, one of those pointers is uh, the a book that we finished writing with O'Reilly a few months uh, ago, which is Mastering Spark with R. And uh, this this is a, a book that basically can take you from start to finish to learn uh, Sparkly R. And I would argue that if you're motivated enough, you can also pick the book and learn R as you're reading through the book. Um, it's definitely a bit of a stretch, but you know, like if you're really motivated. Uh, you can you can get the book and you know like whenever you get stuck with our our concepts um you can look at r for data science which is also available online free, free to use and uh last but not least uh, all the work that our team is developing in the open source world for the r community and in general to make ai easier to use uh, you can find it under, under blogs.rstudio.com slash ai uh, we usually blog about things like um, you know, like different deep learning algorithms and tools, um, you know, uh, things like uh, distributed computing, uh, data management, uh, modeling with things like MLflow and so on. So yeah, definitely uh, subscribe. Uh, we post about every uh, week or so, uh, pretty interesting articles. And yeah, thank you so much. So I think what I'm gonna do right now is I'm gonna go to questions. So if anyone has a questions, um, we can spend a few minutes uh, on the questions uh, section. All right, so so the first question that I have here is, can Sparkly R be used with Python? So um, the, the strict answer is no, you cannot use Sparkly R with Python. Uh, there is, there is a kind of 
similar uh, interface uh, with different perhaps design goals called PySpark to use Spark from Python. Now the philosophy is a bit different because uh, PySpark is specialized in talk in uh, using Spark, um, while Sparkly R has grown a bit, little bit more to support a uh, rich ecosystem of packages and why not? But yeah, so the tool that you would use would be a uh, PySpark if you want to use Spark with Python. Um, what I would say is that uh, we try to interoperate between R and Python. Um, I, I think in general in R Studio, we believe that it's not either or, like it's not a fight between Python and R, uh, but you can really, you know, like de depending on your type of user and your application, you can either use Python or R, or some users use actually both. Um, so we spend a lot of time also making sure that you're not stuck with R. Um, and if you know, if you want to migrate to Python, there's tools and ways of doing that as well. But yeah, um, it's, it's Sparkly R is not a, a Python package. All right, so another question. Is our version four backward compatible with version three? Uh, I would say, yes. So actually one of the things that I'm, I, I think I'm most excited from the R community is that uh, the R has been backwards compatible for many versions. And sure, like there's there's at times little uh, things here and there that um, that change and get deprecated. Uh, but you know, like when uh, when you see the transition between Python two and Python three, uh, there was like a brick a, a significant bridge that people uh, that users have to move and understand between Python two and Python three. Uh, that has not happened with the R programming language, and and it's it's something that I think that is uh, something that I admire from the R maintainers that they have followed kind of like that uh, very you know like standard. A uh, very cautious uh, evolution of the R programming language uh, kind of like reminds me a little bit of uh, the talk from uh, Linus Torvalds this this morning, mor morning where he was putting emphasis on uh, kind of like uh, being consistent with your releases and making sure that things are not broken as your community evolves. So yes, uh, from 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 all my understanding, uh, R has been compatible from version four and also previous versions and even even going behind. Um, Actually, Sparkly R, I don't remember on top of my mind, I think we support version 3.1, which is quite old, uh, maybe seven years or eight years old, um, and all the way to version four. So, uh, and again, most, I'm, I'm, I, at some point I was the core maintainer of Sparkly R, I'm definitely uh, one of the creators, and I've never had to fix a bug where R broke something, which is, is actually quite amazing. Um, yeah, so I think we have time for maybe a couple more questions. Uh, so here's another question. Uh, do you support uh, PMML, uh, PFA, or Onyx? Uh, we unfortunately do not. And uh, I, I would say that that's on my radar and on, on the radar of the team, especially with Onyx. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, um, uh, Sparkly R joined the Linux AI Foundation. And there's there's great projects out there that we should probably be collaborating with, like Horovod and Onyx. Um, it's just that there's there's still a lot of work to do on the Sparkly R project itself. Um, so by all means, like if someone is interested on prototyping or at least exploring or discussing uh, how this integration could look like, um, you can follow. You can contact me in Slack after um, after this talk or you know after Sparks after the Open Source Summit. We also have a Gitter uh, chat room for the Sparkly R project. And you know, feel free to discuss this. I, I think it would be great to have Onyx support for for Sparkly R. Um, Onyx is becoming the standard, um, so I, we're a little bit behind there. But um, I, I would I would want to have that integrated uh, in the near future. All right. So uh, let's see. I think that might be it. So um, I really want to give you thanks for everyone to attending. I hope that you have a great uh, open source summit, and um, I hope to also see you around. Thank you.